Welcome to the Commonwealth Matters. I'm Richard Nelson, Executive Director of the Commonwealth Policy Center. And today we're gonna to talk about critical race theory. Uh, joining us for the conversation is Jonathan Butcher. He is with the Heritage Foundation and uh, recently released a book called Critical Race Theory, or, I'm sorry, Splinter, Crit Critical Race Theory in the Progressive War on Truth. Jonathan, welcome to the program. Thank you, great to be with you. So uh, critical race theory, We're, this is not a light subject. It's obviously very controversial. One of those subjects that people might want to avoid, um, but you wrote a book on it. Uh, tell us uh, what led you to, to want to write a book on this topic? Well, the biggest thing is I wanted Americans to understand what critical race theory really is. I think there's a lot of misinformation in, out there from the media and even from those to advocate for critical race theory who say that it is something that it really is not, uh, or they only give half of the story about what is actually in this theory. So let's be clear, critical race theory is a rejection of both the conservative and liberal interpretations of the Civil Rights Act uh, and of the Civil Rights Movement. It is meant to take the liberal, so the leftist perspective, even further to the radical left. And so, you know, critical race theory came out of what is known as critical legal theory, which was a view of American law that said that American law was created by people in power to maintain their power and to keep mm. certain people, specifically who the uh, individuals they called marginalized, right, uh, mm -hmm. under oppression. And um, this, you know, it, it piggybacks off of the failures in America's past to live up to our aspirations and founding ideals of op op equality under the law, freedom and opportunity. And what critical race theory did was it said, well, let's take this idea that American law is oppressive one step further. And we're gonna say that America is systemically oppressive. So it's not just the law that is the problem, it's the law plus, the law plus culture that is in fact designed only to be oppressive. And this is what pulls us apart, right? This is what is striking at America's sense of national identity. Yeah. So how do you, so critical race theory, as it's being taught in schools or the, the, the common understanding from the conservative camp is that it isolates people based on their race uh, and essentially is a, is a reverse racism. Uh, you see in, in some cases the guilting based on your skin color, um, the dividing in classrooms based on race. We've seen exercises with that. Um, but but in many senses, it's a it's a it's an effort to divide, isolate, and to uh, really um, make race an issue. Is that a correct way? Maybe that uh, I'm saying that conservatives understand that. Is that a correct understanding? Well, I think I think that's what critical race theorists admit. Critical race theorists will even say that they're trying to use guilt as currency, and they'll even say that racial discrimination is their objective. I mean, look, Ibram Kendi, who is the modern day spokesperson for critical race theory says that present discrimination is necessary to because of past discrimination. Future discrimination will be necessary because of present discrimination. Um, individuals such as Richard Delgado, who's a professor from Alabama and one of the founding critical race theorists, he says that um, the only reason civil rights made progress in the United States was because white people found that it was in their interest. Uh, mm -hmm. Delgado and a professor from Harvard named Derek Bell, they called this interest convergence. And they said, the only reason that there's any sort of civil rights progress in the US is because it helps people in power maintain their power. Can I, I'd like to push on that a little bit. My understanding of the civil rights movement is that it was largely fueled by the Christian church. It was Martin Luther King Jr who was a pastor, and it was other pastors, not only in the black church, but in the, in the white church as well, sp specifically the white liberal church, that saw the injustice uh, in man's inhumanity of man uh, and, and, and the unequal treatment towards uh, black people, particularly in the South. Um, so how did critical race theorists, uh, theorists address that, that it was religiously motivated, specifically by Christian principles? 
Well, I think that the roots of critical race theory come from Marxism. And so that is where this separation from religion in general, it parts very quickly. Uh, critical race theory, like I was saying, it's based on critical legal theory, which itself is based on what is known as critical theory. And this is the Marxist idea that came out you know, in the early 20th century that began to divide political thought in the United States really into two camps, right? There's the side that deals with um, democracy, individual value, uh, individuals pursuing their own interests, representative government, and then power struggles, right? Those are really the two, essentially the two main sides of, of political theory that came out of the creation of Marxism, the formation of the Soviet Union, and the Cold War. I mean, this that began to divide how people talked about politics in general. And, and even so today, Marxism, of course, is a rejection of religion completely, right? I mean, that they, they do not believe that there is a place for individuals to pursue their own understanding of anything beyond service to the state or allegiance to uh, the state. And of course, the Marxist you know, that the driving idea behind Marxism is that there is perpetual struggle between individuals and different economic classes. Critical race theorists added on to that and said that this perpetual power struggle is over racial issues. You say in your book that uh, nearly a quarter of the population, you're referring to the U.S. population, is unable to understand even the most rudimentary aspects of how their government works. And that is a frightening prospect for only half to know all three branches of government is hardly consoling. So when they're presented with an alternative, false and misleading narrative about America and the vital issue of racial discrimination in its past, far too many Americans lack the knowledge to recognize and reject such revisionist history. As critical race theorists push their worldview into K through 12 classrooms, there are few who can articulate a response. Uh, my question to you, Jonathan, is this. Um, in states, state legislatures across the country, states like Kentucky, um, there has been legislation that uh, both bans the teaching of critical race theory and then also uh, encourages the teaching of America's founding documents and important speeches, which is a bill uh, that the Kentucky State Legislature passed into law, which required uh, the teaching of a number of historical documents and important speeches. That effort alone created controversy within, largely within the teaching establishment, and their argument was this. Um, you should not legislate what's going on in the public schools. You should not dictate curriculum to teachers, whether K through 12 or in higher ed. That bill only, by the way, only dealt with K through 12 education, as I recall. How do you respond to that, that legislatures shouldn't deal with critical race theory, either banning it or uh, affirming and, and requiring the teaching of America's founding documents? Well, an important component of critical race theory that we haven't gotten to yet is that it is meant to be applied. So one of the founding uh, writers of uh, around critical race theory was Kimberly Crenshaw, and I like to quote her on this. She says that critical race theory is a verb. It's meant to be used. It's not just a Marxist idea. It is actually a formula for taking apart American society. That, that's what it is, and they say it themselves. They call it a verb. Okay, so to your question, so what does this mean for school curriculum? Well, we have to separate the application of critical race theory and its ideas from the teaching of academics. And so if we're talking about the teaching of academics, it varies state by state. Some states have a legislature that is more involved in what is taught in schools and forming the curriculum and setting the standards. Uh, I would argue that that's what state boards of education are for, as well as local boards of education and local school boards. I think it more properly fits within their realm of responsibility than the state legislature. Nevertheless, though, it is the legislature's responsibility to make sure that no one faces racial discrimination. And so in a model bill that the Heritage Foundation has developed and that we have helped uh, move in places like, um, succeed in places like Mississippi, Georgia, uh, executive orders in Virginia, South Dakota, and, and elsewhere also use this language, no individual, no teacher or student should be compelled to affirm or believe any idea that violates the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This is an important idea that law, lawmakers must preserve. 
And by saying this to schools, what you are saying is you cannot have a mandatory affinity group where you separate children according to skin color for different school activities. You cannot ask a student to complete an assignment where they score or rank themselves based on their oppressive uh, oppression because of the color of their skin. You cannot have a diversity training program that teachers complete that asks teachers to affirm that they are inherently biased just because of the color of their skin. Those are the applications of critical race theory. Look, if a school wants to assign the Communist Manifesto as reading material to compare it to um, some of our founding documents from Jefferson, uh, you know, Franklin, et cetera, I mean, that's, that, that is an exercise, that's an academic exercise. If they wanna teach who Derrick Bell is and his influence on um, President Barack Obama, for example, I mean, there's a lesson in that. Um, but that's different than saying that you must understand math, reading, literature, history, social studies, science, all through the lens of critical race theory. And that, that is what critical race theory in K-12 instruction aims to do. It aims to say that it's no longer just about math. Math is about white supremacy. That's what the curriculum in California on math says. Uh, and there are examples in science, et cetera. You know, what's interesting is that um, we know that oppression and injustice and great evils is really not based on skin color. If you look at what happened in Rwanda, the black on black genocide just based on tribal differences and ethnic uh, differences, we know that there's something else going on uh, other than skin color. Is, is this something that um, those who espouse uh, CRT are able to admit. I mean, and that's just one example of Rwanda, but we see it all throughout history where there is uh, awful things done, man's inhumanity to man done, um, not just by, it doesn't come from the tone of your skin color, does it? Well, the original critical race theorists were and are today obsessed with power. They're arguing that life is about a power struggle. There is no neutral ground, right? Uh, and that's, again, this is Kendi's work, talks about how you are either an anti-racist or a racist. There's nothing in between. And if you are an anti-racist, that doesn't mean that you actually oppose racism. What it means is that you believe that capitalism and racism are conjoined twins. That's what you believe. You believe that discrimination is necessary to overcome past discrimination. That's what that means. I would say this. One of, the, uh, one of the arguments that's made by critical race theorists today is they will say, I don't want another lesson about Martin Luther King Jr. and his speech about how we are defined by the, the, our character instead of the color of our skin. And in fact, Kendi writes as much, again, in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. So I will leave you, I'll give you this. Martin Luther King Jr. also wrote a series of sermons on loving your neighbor and how important it is to have love for your neighbor in order for a civilization, in order for a culture to survive. And that's a big part of what I talk about in my book is that in order for the American identity, in order for our society to, to survive, we have to have a shared set of assumptions about what it means to live in this country and about what uh, right and wrong actually are. There's a, a fancy word for this that I define in the book called habitus. It's, a, it's an idea that goes back, I mean, really as far as Aristotle, if not before, but in recent years, you know, the past century or so, uh, there was a French philosopher named Bordeaux who talked about it. There's um, uh, modern day uh, scholars such as um, James Davison Hunter, who writes about this as well. Even Robin DiAngelo, who is a, a you know, a critical race theorist today writes about it in her book. And she makes the opposite argument that I have made, or I made the opposite argument that she made. And that is that she argues that America's habitus is white supremacy. She argues that we are built on white supremacy and our shared understanding of right and wrong is all based around white supremacy, right? I am arguing that no, that's, that's not it at all. Um, I argue that uh, our founding ideals, our founding documents, and what we share as Americans is the belief that we are equal under the law. We are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, right? That's what defines us. And so the failures in America's past, slavery, the Jim Crow era, 
the and these were systemic right at the time right those don't represent who we are and our representative system is a self-correcting mechanism that helped us to overcome those no those are those are good points I, i'm also as you as you're articulating that jonathan i'm thinking of america being a melting pot we have people from every nation every ethnicity that is here and every nation and, and immigrants from every ethnicity want to come here. Uh, and if we were continue, continue to be systemically racist, continue to be systemically unjust, uh, where there is no rule of law, where there's no upholding of human dignity, why are people still trying to get here? Um, I mean, we're, we're still this shining city set on a hill. We're still this beacon of hope where people who are living in other nations where they don't have the freedom, where they don't have maximum opportunity, uh, where they don't have the rule of law. And um, so, so I, I'm concerned as I say this, I'm concerned that we as Americans don't appreciate what we have, that we do not understand what we have. We do not understand um, the, the, the freedoms that we enjoy compared to much of the world. Uh, I think it's something like half of the popu of the world's population is living uh, uh, without democratic means of uh, governance. Uh, maybe it's greater than that, where there are human rights, fundamental universal human rights are not acknowledged or protected by the government. What is what can we do as Americans to uh, better understand what we have and then to preserve what we have so that we can continue being that shining city set on a hill. Is there anything well, as, look, as Americans that we can do? I mean, the first is to take head on um, the what I feel like is the strongest argument that critical race theorists have, which does have a weakness at the end. So the strongest argument that a critical race theorist may make is that there are different outcomes for people in different walks of life in the United States today. And they will say that there are people who do not have food to eat, who do not have a home, who um, are set up in a system without intact parents assigned to failing schools, um, and that you know this is structural, it's created by the system. And our response to that must be that the only way that you can create equal outcomes for everyone is through coercion. The only way that you can do that, you cannot, uh, there's no other way to create the same sort of um, successes or a money or um, employment for everyone is by force. And no one wants that, right? We know what that brings. Um, anyone who remembers uh, or looks today at what the living conditions are in different parts of China, for example, um, under you know, will understand that this type of coercion and force can only create slavery. Okay, so what the critical race theorists, again, who are Marxists, are saying is that well, if we only did Marxism right, why then we could have this great system that that would create the same sort of outcomes for everyone. But we don't want the same outcomes for everyone, right? We want to remove the obstacles for people to create their own version of human flourishing. We need to make sure that there's nothing in American law, that there's nothing in regulation, that there's nothing culturally that gets in the way that becomes an obstacle for people to pursue the things that they want. So let's be very specific. What does this mean in terms of education? Don't assign students to school based on their zip code. We shouldn't have residential assignment. Parents should be allowed to choose how and where their children learn at home, at a private school, at a public school across town, that should be within parents' freedom to do that. That helps to remove that obstacle. No, that's a good, uh, a good place to start. And, I, and I'm thinking that um, as, as, we, uh, as we engage this difficult issue, um, I'm just wondering, so, so you mentioned that we don't want equal outcomes because it will take government coercion to achieve that. Um, it takes an understanding of what we have, an understanding of freedom, and it also takes discipline to achieve what you believe you're made for. It takes discipline to study and to get up early in the morning, to, to go to work. And um, I mean, there's some concern that some people have, have just given up, that they feel like the system is rigged and that's what CRT teaches, the system's rigged. No matter what you do, you the man is gonna keep you down. Um, 
what can we do to over, overcome that? I guess you, you just mentioned it. I'm, maybe I'm answering my own question. Education, right? It starts with education. Um, but how do we further empower people? How do we, because it's, Jonathan, it seems like the mainstream media has bought into CRT. Um, influencers, political influencers have bought into CRT and they're pushing it. How do we further um, address this and, and let people know, let other Americans know that they do have the freedom, that they do have opportunity, that there are options for them? Well, I think we see critical race theory in all sorts of different policy areas. And so I think overall, the big overarching perspective is we must recognize racial discrimination for what it is and say that it doesn't belong in our law or politics or culture in any shape or form. So anything that results on different treatment uh, of individuals based on an immutable characteristic, ethnicity, country of origin, um, that is uh, that should be removed from both our law as well as our culture. In education, we can do that with some of the things that we've talked about already, right? So prohibiting compelled speech, saying that mandatory affinity groups have no place in our schools, saying that uh, students should not be asked to affirm their oppressive level of oppression based on skin color, et cetera. But we have to go on to the other areas of policy where this is impacting life today too. Take healthcare, for example. There were calls for individuals to receive certain treatments for COVID, for example, based on the color of their skin, putting them at the head of the line, uh, ir irrespective of what their other underlying conditions may be, what their actual health needs are. Certainly in the area of healthcare, we should be able to say, individuals should be treated based on their, based on their case, right? Based on their circumstances, based on what their uh, symptoms are, based on their underlying conditions, not just based on the color of their skin. The same can go for business, right? We can look at business today and they're, today companies are being judged based on ESG scores, right? Environmental social governance scores. Mm -hmm. And that's how much a, a, a business is committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and a commitment to combating climate change, whatever that may mean, um, as well as a variety of other woke causes that fall under this umbrella of, of critical theory, right? We should be making the case that um, businesses certainly have social responsibilities, but that should be um, up to them, and they should not be imposing that on investors for whom they have entrusted their money, right, to um, to help create uh, to, to help create wealth, right. This has all been reversed, so we can see this across different policy areas too. All really coming back to discrimination. Yeah, no, very good, Jonathan. We're seeing. Uh, my observation is that CRT um, really comes through the intelligentsia, the, the academia, uh, at our universities, and I'm wondering our the universities in general in this country, are they receptive to a position like yours? I mean, you came out with a book, have you been invited to speak on campuses on this topic? Uh, so I have spoken for some universities. I have not, uh, have yet to be in, it really invited on campus to debate someone about critical race theory. Now I was invited to one debate with Marist at Marist College with someone who is a critical race theorist. So I have done one. Um, I've been on panels that have talked about it, but you know, I, I, the, the short answer is, is kind of no, right? It's not like universities are saying, oh, here's a chance for us to debate something that is you know, all over our campus and we're committed to with someone who thinks differently. So no, that's not really happened. I think you know, more and more universities today, they are, are completely bought and sold uh, in, in this idea of critical race theory. And I have a whole chapter really on how critical race theory is driving the free speech crisis on college campuses. So what, what's the solution? And I, I know that's a simple question. It's probably a complicated answer, but the universities are supposed to be places where important ideas are debated and discussed in research. You have both sides of an issue presented to students, and yet that's not happening. What, where, where do we begin to restore the universities to be a place where the pursuit of truth can take place and these discussions can happen? Yeah, I, I think the big objective of the pursuit of truth is a much longer goal in the short term anyway, and something that will lead us there is making sure that any individual who is lawfully present on a public college campus in a publicly accessible space should be free to listen and be heard to whatever is happening, right? Shout downs are not appropriate and should be just disallowed. Uh, free speech zones should be abolished. Um, even more specific things like uh, bias response teams, 
which are these programs that allow people to anonymously report on something they heard someone else say, and then whoever said this would be investigated by the administration. That is a, I mean, a Soviet style um, policy that must be abolished. Uh, and there are great groups, um, the Goldwater Institute, who I'm uh, a senior fellow with is working on this issue, a group called Parents Defending Education, as well as another called Speech First. They are all actively engaged in, in promoting um, uh, these kinds of free speech policies on campus. That will get us a, you know, a, a, a long way towards, I think, this ultimate objective of, of uh, the pursuit of truth. And I think just as with K-12, there should be policies that say that no individual on campus should, in a, in a public college, should compel a professor or student to affirm a certain idea because it's the school policy related to some political issue. So whether it's um, uh, boycotting or di divesting positions that a university has taken, individuals, uh, students and professors shouldn't be compelled to take that same position. They should be free to speak out against it if they so choose and, and other examples. Very good. Uh, by the way, if we are able to get you into one of Kentucky's universities to debate this issue, would you be willing to take us up on that to bring you to? Oh, the I'd be pleased. Yes, okay. I'd be pleased. Uh, we'll see what we can do to uh, to make that happen. You are coming to Kentucky tomorrow. You're going to be in Owensboro to speak at our Christianity and Culture Conference to talk about the topic of uh, CRT, critical race theory. And uh, we're very much looking forward to that. Jonathan, we are uh, just about out of time. We've got just a minute and a half. Do you have any final thoughts, final words, maybe a word of encouragement as we deal with this uh, challenging issue? Well, some of the most encouraging things that we, uh, that we can see today are that surveys show that parents don't like this idea in schools. They don't believe that America is only defined by racism, but rather we are defined by our commitment to opportunity and equality under the law. And the more we see surveys that Heritage has conducted, Parents Defending Education has conducted some, um, ACTA, the uh, Association of Council, American Council of Trustees and Alumni, um, has had surveys showing this as well. So, you know, we know that Americans understand that discrimination is wrong and that America is more than just a place of prejudice. So we, we can take that to heart. Very good. Thank you for those encouraging words, Jonathan. If you'd like to receive Jonathan's book, uh, recently came out. It's called Splintered Critical Race Theory and the Progressive War on Truth. It is on Amazon. And Jonathan, tell us briefly, um, how's your book selling? Are you getting a good response to it? Good, I think the feedback has, has been good. And I do think even the, the chances to, um, the few chances to debate uh, have, been, have been excellent, but the speaking engagements uh, really have, have been excellent as well. So I have had the chance to, to really talk either virtually or in person around the country um, about this. And so, uh, I mean, I was in California just recently. I just came back last week. Um, I, we've done this, I've talked about it in Florida. And, and so it's, it's really, um, it's been a great opportunity to talk about the truth, about what we need to understand as a shared identity. Very good. Thank you. We're so much looking forward to you joining us in Owensboro tomorrow. God bless you. Safe travels to Kentucky, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.